So, if you're watching this video, then chances are you've obviously already seen these ones. Right. Of course you have. And since comedy comes in threes. D&D 5e and Pathfinder 2e are a lot more different than people realize at first glance. It's really easy to look at them and say, oh, human fighters with strength, dex, and constitution. Must be the same game, right? Not really, no. In fact, they are incredibly different. So different that I've made two videos in the past going over ten major differences, and I've got five more here for you today. So strap in, here's five more differences between D&D 5e and Pathfinder 2e. Massive shout out to all of the members of the Known At Ones Patreon page on screen right now. If you would like to support the channel and get your name on this list aside all these generous people, there is a link in the description where you can pledge $10 a month to help me keep doing what I'm doing. I seriously appreciate it. Thank you so much. On with the video. Let's start with a big one. Class progression is so different between these two systems, it's wild. And again, at first glance, it might not seem like it. Every single class has a list of guaranteed class features they get at very specific levels. No matter what subclass you pick, you get those features, right? Well, in D&D 5e, you specifically need to keep leveling up that class. If you want the, I have no idea, 7th level Cleric feature off the top of my head, you need to take 7 levels of Cleric and get to that point. Pathfinder 2e works completely differently in this regard, because Pathfinder doesn't use the same multi-classing system as D&D 5e. No, in Pathfinder 2e, once you have picked your character's primary class at level 1, that will always be their primary class, no matter what other decisions you make leveling up. Features are tied to levels in Pathfinder 2e, so no matter what you take, if you are a 7th level cleric who takes a fighter archetype, that is not going to slow down your cleric progression in any way. Every single ranger gets trackless journey at level 5, no matter what feats they take, or subclass they pick, or archetypes they pick, even if those are multi-class archetypes. Now don't panic, this won't make your character any less unique. Class features as a whole are just a baseline. They'll usually be things like weapon proficiency, saving throw proficiency, and some unique features, but even those features aren't set in stone because there are usually feats and things you can take to augment them and make them unique to your own build, or some of these features will differ depending on your subclass. Now, there is obviously a downside to this as well, and that is that some unique features are locked behind only characters whose primary class is that class. Nobody can ever get the Mighty Rage feature of the Barbarian at level 11, except for base class Barbarians. Even the Barbarian archetype will not give you access to this kind of feature. So whether this is a boon or a negative is totally up to you as the kind of player you are. If you really want to mix and match classes to make your own totally unique kind of class progression, D&D 5e is inherently better at that. However, if you want to explore diversifying yourself without sacrificing the major benefits of your class, Pathfinder 2e might be better. I know one of my personal biggest gripes, and this is just a me thing, is that if you multi-class even one level in D&D 5e, you have permanent permanently locked yourself out of your level 20 capstone features for that class, and that can feel kind of bad, even if campaigns don't always get to level 20, it's just a mental thing for me. So weigh the pros and cons of these two different types of class progression when deciding what system you might want to play next. Skills are fun. Skills are how you interact with the world around you, and again, 5e and PF2 handle them very differently, especially when it comes to skill progression. If you've played 5e, obviously you're familiar with Proficiency. You get your proficiency in skills based on your class and your background, and occasionally you can take a feat, possibly, to gain proficiency in a new skill. I think the feat is actually called Skilled in 5e. Pathfinder 2e makes skills a lot deeper when it comes to how proficient you actually are. Unlike D&D 5e, whose proficiency bonus scales at specific levels, Pathfinder 2e's proficiency bonus does scale every single level, but each skill also has its own individual four levels of proficiency. Five if you count untrained. 
Any skill can be trained, expert, master, or legendary proficiency applying a flat plus two to that skill for each rank you are. So if you are master in athletics, you get a flat plus six on top of your level in proficiency bonus. But that's not what this tidbit is about. No, this tidbit is about skill progression. See, in 5e, aside from those skills, it's hard to gain proficiency in something new. There is no set character level that says, hey, gain proficiency in a new skill. Pathfinder 2e, however, happens every single odd level, no matter what class you're playing, with one terrifying exception. Pathfinder 2e, every single odd level, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc., you get a choice to either increase one skill's proficiency by a stage, like from trained to expert, effectively getting a permanent plus two to that skill forever, or training in a brand new skill. Obviously, these are limited. You only get 10 of these. Is it 10? 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Nine of these throughout your character's entire life. So each one is pretty important. And so you actually have a choice as a player on how you want to handle it. Do you want to go wide and become trained in a bunch of different skills so that you can apply a decent roll bonus to everything? Or do you go really hard and bump in maybe six of those nine bumps into two skills to become legendary in both of them, getting a flat plus eight on top of the base proficiency bonus? There's a lot of choices to make. You can even go right in the middle, maybe be an expert or master at four or five different skills. The way you can advance your skill proficiencies being completely customizable is really cool in PF2 and lets you really decide just how much of an expert expert your character is in any given skill. Your skills are going to change a lot over those 20 levels, so don't feel like you are stuck with your level 1 baseline skills, because every couple of levels you get to choose how you want to advance them. And just for fun, let's talk about that one terrifying example I was talking about, the Rogue! The Rogue in Pathfinder 2e is really good at combat, but where it shines is in its skill proficiencies. Unlike every other class in the game, Rogues get a skill increase every single level. So while every other class only gets nine skill increases throughout the game, the rogue gets 19. The rogue is designed as a skill monkey, and it's kind of cool to see when the rogue is master at seven different skills by level 12. It's really, really cool, honestly. It gives it a unique identity in a game that was obviously designed for combat encounters. Ancestry feats are kind of cool. In D&D 5e, a big choice you do have to make is your race, or I believe it's going to be called Ancestry in D&D 2024, and your Ancestry decides a lot for you. It gives you a bunch of unique bonuses. If you're playing rules as written in D&D, it bumps certain ability scores up. It's a really big decision. And then it never comes up again. Maybe those abilities will come up, but what you got from being a dwarf isn't going to change from levels 1 to 20. Pathfinder 2e decided to say, hey, what if you became more in tune with your lineage, your ancestry, over time and unlocked more secrets of your own people's powers? Enter Ancestry Feats. You get one of these at level 1, and it's usually something cool, like maybe a little bit of resistance to a certain kind of saving throw, or maybe a magical cantrip if you're something like a gnome or an elf intrinsically related to magic. But then, every four levels at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17, you get an extra extra feat, another ancestry feat. And ancestry feats, obviously you can take another level 1 one if you want to, but they also have feats that are locked behind levels 5, 9, 13, and 17, getting steadily stronger. And these become so flavorful and new sources of abilities and powers that don't just have to come from your class. Take a look at the new Merfolk ancestry that at level 17 can literally summon the Kraken to attack their enemies because they're so strong, they're so in tune with with their own lineage and origins that they can conjure the magic of their people to summon a kraken. It doesn't matter if you're a fighter or a champion or a rogue, you have access to that kraken feat, which leads to even more crazy character customization, especially at later levels. I do wish that you got them a little more often because the fact that they only come up every four levels typically means that in an average campaign that ends around level 10, this is only gonna happen twice, but it still adds that little bit of extra depth to your character beyond just your class of choice. And people have gotten super creative with some of these mixing and matching just the right ancestries with just the right classes to do some bonkers stuff. There's some really cool synergies with things like this dwarf feat that I forget the name of, mixed with the Flurry Ranger, just adding bonus damage to all of their attacks under the right circumstances. It's awesome. 
So keep this in mind when you pick your ancestry when making your character. It's far more than just baseline statistics at level 1. Make sure there are level 5, 9, and onward feats that interest you that you'll want to pick up at those levels. Hey, did you know that Pathfinder doesn't have an initiative stat? It's true, there is nowhere on the Pathfinder 2e character sheet that says initiative. Obviously in 5e, when a combat encounter breaks out, everybody rolls their initiative stat, plain and simple. Pathfinder decided to take a little bit more of a creative approach when it comes to starting a combat encounter. By default, all characters roll perception for initiative, which is actually wisdom based, and I can see it making more sense to some people. Your ability to react to an encounter is your ability to register that an encounter is happening. I understand why D&D uses dexterity, since that's sort of your physical ability to respond faster, but I feel like there's a case to be made for both. And that's exactly why in Pathfinder 2e, perception is not the only thing you can roll for initiative. You see, depending on the situation, you can roll any skill for initiative at the start of a combat encounter, but only if it is applicable. The most obvious example is, hey, your rogue was hiding in a bush when the combat encounter started? Cool, they can roll stealth for their initiative because they are hiding. Your barbarian just kicked down a door with a bunch of angry giant rats behind it? Let them roll athletics for initiative to just keep going with that momentum from kicking down the door into the combat. There is no set in stone rule for when and how each skill can be used as initiative, but it is entirely up to GM discretion. So players never be afraid to ask, hey, we're balancing on the scaffolding of a building for this encounter. Can I roll acrobatics for my initiative? And GMs, don't be afraid to say yes. This will never be some overpowered game-breaking thing. At most, it's going to give them a slightly higher initiative roll and let them feel more immersed because their character is utilizing the skills they're good at to get a leg up at the start of combat. And that's so freaking cool. And our final difference today is weapons and runes. D&D 5e, it's hard to back up their weapon design. It's simple, which is really, really great for new players. But at the end of the day, D&D 5e weapons are damage die. They're damage die, they're a number of hands, and sometimes they'll have reach. Fantastic to pick up and just say, here's how much damage you do. I love the simplicity of the D&D 5e weapon design. Pathfinder 2e decided to take weapons and make them their own subsystem because of the weapon traits. Along with having the same basics as D&D weapons, Pathfinder weapons, of course, have damage die. They have simple versus martial weapons, just like D&D 5e. They have a number of hands to use them, but every single weapon in the game comes with one or more traits. All of these traits grant specific bonuses to specific scenarios. For example, the grapple, trip, and shove traits let you apply the weapon's magical bonus, so if it's a plus one weapon, you get to add that plus one to your athletics checks to grapple or trip or shove with that weapon because the weapon is designed with that kind of fighting style in mind. The backswing trait allows you to, if you miss an attack, sort of just keep going with that momentum and get a plus one to your next attack attack because you missed and just kept swinging with it, which is so freaking cool. The backstabber trait applies bonus damage when you are attacking an off-guard target, almost like a built-in mini mini sneak attack in the weapon, which stacks with sneak attack. There are literally dozens of weapon traits to the point where it can be really overwhelming. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. When you first look at weapon traits, especially if you just go to the chapter in the book about weapon traits, there are so many that it can be super overwhelming. My advice, pick the weapon that you think looks the coolest or makes the most sense for your character. You know, you wanna be a polearm fighter? Cool, use a halberd, and then once you've picked your weapon, look at the weapon traits. These traits are not totally game-changing. They're not gonna double your damage, except for fatal, and they're not gonna make you totally useless or the star of any combat. But they are going to encourage you to use that weapon in a unique way that you might not have thought to use before. It'll encourage you to use your athletics actions. It'll encourage you to make sure you're flanking for the backstabber damage, and it's super cool. 
But beyond that, weapons really get interesting when you start working with Pathfinder's rune system. D&D 5e has pretty basic magic item systems, where weapons will be plus one, plus two, plus three, giving you a bonus to their attack roll and damage, and then they'll have some kind of cool magical effect. Usually with D&D, it'll be specific magic items like a flame tongue sword. Pathfinder 2e, however, sort of has a mix and match Lego system in their runes. There are two different types of runes, fundamental and property. Fundamental are the basic runes that every weapon is going to want to have. These are your plus one, plus two, plus three, but in Pathfinder, those don't increase your damage. They only increase your accuracy. What you need to increase damage are the striking runes. There are three levels of striking, and each one adds an additional damage die onto that weapon. So if you've got a D8 longsword, if you add striking to it, now when you attack, it deals 2D8. You apply greater striking, 3D8. Major striking, 4d8 base damage on that weapon. But where the customization really pops off is in the property runes. Now there is a requirement. You can only have as many property runes on a weapon as its potency runes value. So if it is a plus one weapon, it can have one property rune. If it's a plus three weapon, it can have three property runes. This means the higher level you get, the more fancy customizable magic items you can create. And this gives the player such a sense of freedom that they can craft their own legendary piece of equipment. And beyond that, they can keep the same piece of equipment throughout the game and inscribe new and stronger runes on top of it. So maybe early on, you get a plus one striking flaming longbow. Super cool. Fast forward 15 levels. You've now upgraded this to be a plus three greater striking, giant killing, hopeful, greater flaming longbow, which you'll probably name something cool like Meteor. Now when you're fighting with Meteor, you get to apply all of those different runes, its base damage is way higher, it's way more accurate, and at the end of the day, it is still the same trusty longbow you started the campaign with, which is awesome. Sort of how in D&D 5e, most GMs will hand wave it saying, yeah, yeah, this new store in the city sells any magic item of level 8 or lower. If it's a unique weapon, they sell it. Pathfinder 2e is the same way, just with runes. You go to a new shop and the GM will say, okay, yeah, this shop will sell any runes of level 8 or lower, so you can buy and apply any of those runes to your weapons. It's a really cool way for players to sink their money into customizing their weapons and armor for that matter, but that's for a future video. And it leans even more into Pathfinder 2e's big game design focus of customizability. How every single character in the game is going to be totally unique and different from every other character. Not just from a flavorful roleplay perspective, but from a mechanical perspective too. Because you can customize your class, you can customize your ancestry, you can customize your gear, all of that will coalesce into this completely unique character that nobody has ever played before. And it's something I really love about the game. And if that's too much and that's not what you're looking for in a game, that's completely fine. But I always encourage people to try PF2 at least once before knocking it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones.